Thank you for the introduction there. So I think we have an exciting talk here for you today. Uh, and by exciting, I will define that to mean I'm going to disagree with the speaker before me. Um, <laughs> so I particularly uh, want to thank the last question, or second to last question we had, because that is exactly the point I'm going to make here. We should do all of our packet scheduling in hardware. Um, and so that is what I'm going to be talking about here for the rest of my presentation. I'm going to talk about Loom, a new network interface card design that offloads all of our per flow scheduling decisions from our operating system into our NIC. Okay, so we're gonna have a little bit of a two-phase introduction here. We're gonna have an outline for introduction. Uh, so what we're gonna cover to really get into why we want to offload all of our packet scheduling to NIC is first we're gonna go over why it's important. We are sufficiently motivated, I think, so we'll go through that quickly. We're gonna talk about what's wrong with current NICs, and really this is why uh, Eiffel is not able to enforce policies today. Then we're gonna talk about why we should offload all of our packet scheduling rather than just some of our packet scheduling to the NIC. Okay, so getting two things. Why is packet scheduling important? And really the motivation here that I am gonna talk about is application co-location. So this is the idea that we would like to increase the CPU and somehow server utilization and efficiency of our application. So in this case, we have two tenants. Tenant one is running Memcached and Spark, different types of applications. Tenant two is just running Spark. So in this case, writing our CPU isolation policy for this imaginary eight core server here is really relatively simple. Uh, on the right here, we have pseudocode where I say Memcached gets three cores for tenant one, Spark for tenant one gets one core, tenant two gets four cores. This is relatively simple and this is really the cloud we should all be familiar with. The problem here becomes how do we now specify our application performance isolation policy in terms of the network rather than just the CPU? This is particularly problematic because these different applications have differing network performance goals. We're going to use in this presentation as a running example, Memcached is our low latency application and Spark is our high throughput application. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna go through is how a network operator might want to try to specify some sort of high level network policy for isolating these different applications I'm running. So in this case, I'm gonna start with my two applications in VM1. I, as an operator, am gonna say that my memcached traffic is more important and therefore it is going to be given a higher network priority over my Spark traffic. So in pseudocode on the left, I go and do this assignment through my priority scheduling node. Okay, now following up on this Eiffel motivation, we have things with rate limiting in our network core and our network bandwidth that we need to share as well. So in this case, I'm gonna put these into a filter and I'll say if this traffic is destined for the WAN, I will apply a 15 gigabit per second rate limit. Otherwise, I'll leave it unrate limited. Okay, then finally, we need to add in VM2 here. In this case, we've decided as an operator that we'd like to fairly share traffic between VM1 and VM2, so we add in this new fair scheduling node. The key point here, though, is that a network operator needs the ability to both specify and enforce this network policy, and as we heard in Eiffel, enforcing this network policy really comes down to enforcing a packet schedule. Okay, so in Loom, we're gonna talk about contributions in both these areas. But before that, we need to talk about what is wrong with current NICs and why I can't enforce my packet schedule today. Okay, and so if we were to use a single queue interface NIC, which was the standard when NICs were first created, uh, we would be able to enforce our scheduling policy. But so this is the problem, is that this is not scalable in terms of CPU, and it's not able to drive these increasing Ethernet line rates of 100, 200, 400 gig. Okay, so in general, the throughput limitation that we're coming up is that a single core, especially for these small size packet transfers, think ERPC, is not going to be able to drive full 100 gigabit line rate. Additionally, the software scheduling can increase things like CPU and latency. Um, so th the way we have solved this, this is not essentially a fundamental problem. NICs exist. Operating systems are able to send data out these NICs at line rate. And the way we do this is with a multi-queue NIC. We have different applications and flows, each having their own queue. 
because they can interact with this queue, it's just in memory, they can do so independently, they can ring doorbells, all of this happens in parallel. So the idea is now that we can scale our throughput across our many tens of cores on our server. However, the big problem that we have here is that now our NIC is responsible for picking which packet from which queue gets sent at any given point in time. This is what I'm going to call our NIC packet scheduler. Okay, so one of the big problems is if we now have our NIC packet scheduler and we try to layer software scheduling on top of this, we're not able to enforce our policy. Uh, so specifically, we're gonna use this running straw man that we're gonna call MQ, where every core is independently, without talking to any other core, trying to locally enforce its policy. You can think of this as our straw man for scaling up uh, the performance of Eiffel across multiple cores. Okay, so in this sort of toy example, we can see really exactly what the problem is. We have Memcached and Spark Computing, they each have their own queues, but because my NIC packet scheduler is just doing naive round robin across queues, we can actually get significant latency. This latency is gonna increase as we continue to increase these number of queues. Okay, so hopefully you're sufficiently motivated that we need some packet scheduling on our NIC. As soon as we have a multi-queue NIC, we have to do some packet scheduling. But the question then is, why should I do all of my packet scheduling on the NIC rather than some sort of other hybrid approach. And so to wrap up this motivation here, we would wanna look at these different options for where we split the labor between the operating system and NIC. This first option here I've already talked about is single queue. We enforce our entire policy in software. This is great for isolation. This is bad for CPU utilization and bad for throughput. We have multi-queue, which you can sort of think is trying to enforce this policy somewhere in the middle. That was the example we just showed, was enforcing the priority, was not able to do so. So here the problem is, we get scalable throughput, but we aren't actually able to enforce our network policy. And so what we're here to propose is Loom. This idea that every flow gets its own queue, and all policy enforcement is entirely operated to the NIC. This allows us to have a precise policy enforcement, and it allows us to have low CPU utilization. So this brings us to maybe the title card slide of this talk, where I'm gonna spend the rest of my time talking about Loom, my new NIC design, where we're gonna put all of our per flow scheduling decisions into the NIC. Specifically, we're gonna do this by doing, using a queue per flow and offloading everything to NIC packet schedulers rather than software packet schedulers. And so really, I wouldn't be up here if it was easy to do this. And so what I'm gonna be doing for the rest of the talk is talking about why it is hard to do this today, why existing NICs fail to be able to do this efficiently, and the contributions that we've made to enable you to be able to efficiently and flexibly program a hardware NIC packet scheduler. Uh, particularly the problem that we're trying to solve here is that NIC packet schedulers are currently the thing that is getting in my way in cloud data centers from me being able to ensure that my applications fairly share the network. Okay, so in more detail, we've gone over introduction. We will eventually get to an evaluation, but we're gonna spend most of our time here on some contributions. And really, we have contributions in three different areas in this policy specification and enforcement. So the first thing we do is we have a contribution in the area of specification. We have a new policy graph abstraction. This would be useful even in the context of Eiffel as well. Uh, we have a new enforcement policy. This is a new way of building programmable networking hardware that allows us to enforce our new abstraction. And then finally, we have an interface problem. So we're gonna spend some time talking about how we have a new efficient interface. Okay, so like I said, three contributions, we're gonna talk first about specification of Loom. Okay. And really, what we're trying to answer here is, what scheduling policies would my operator like to be able to specify for performance isolation, and how should these performance isolation policies be specified? Uh, the short answer is I already showed you in the introduction, uh, this graph that I introduced as a motivating example is itself a valid Loom policy graph. Okay, so this slide is dense. I'll try to get over it in some detail. Start off with, we have two different types of nodes. We have scheduling nodes. These are important for specifying work conserving policies. These are things that you could think about for sharing my local link bandwidth. 
We also have shaping nodes. This is like before with other systems, used for rate limiting things. In our example, it's for sharing the WAN or data center network. This is important for systems like IQ and BWE. And finally, uh, another important aspect of this graph that is maybe difficult to show is that every single one of these scheduling and shaping nodes is programmable with some local custom NQ and DQ functions. Uh, important, although this um, may seem relatively simple and obvious, this new abstraction is able to specify policies that neither Linux nor Domino are able to capture. Uh, and also, like I said, this is important for systems like BWE, and IEQ that are used for sharing our data center and WAN networks. Okay, so in more detail, we have these two types of loom policies. So an example, it's for allowing us to specify the following types of policies. If I wanted to say that all of the flows from competing Spark jobs fairly share network bandwidth, uh, this would be my sh scheduling policy. Similarly, we want to rate limit our traffic from VM to VM. Uh, so the build-in that I've done here is that I want to point out that these two different policies group my flows differently from each other. And that's the key problem that we're trying to solve here with our Loom policy abstraction. Okay, so the first policy that I'm specifying groups all of my flows together by the source, where the second policy I'm specifying is grouping things together by their destination. And because of this, they can't be expressed as a tree. And so that's this key contribution here in the Loom policy abstraction. Prior abstractions have been trees. We now build in this restricted DAG. Okay, a little bit more on this before we move on. So how would I specify what are the valid rules in my Loom policy abstraction DAG? Uh, we have a following legend that shows what is and is not allowed. The high level idea you can think is that if I were to remove all of my shaping nodes, my rate limiting nodes, my DAG would then form a tree. Uh, the key reason behind this is that we want to ensure that a scheduling decision made by a child never gets reordered by a parent. And so that's why we allow transitions A and C here, whereas if we allowed for these graph types B and D, we would now have uh, this potential reordering dependency. Okay. So uh, the important DAG aspect that we're adding here is in part C. So what we see here is what we allow, is we allow for packets that were coming from some scheduling node, they can be broken out into different classes, essentially aggregated differently, then sort of re-aggregated together into this FIFO. Okay, so that's the new Loom policy abstraction. So now we're gonna move on to the second part of our contributions. So now that we have this new policy abstraction, the major challenge left is how do we enforce this policy? Okay, so how do we enforce this policy? Uh, so the naive thing to do would be to, in hardware, add many more and more shaping queues as needed to support the many more classes of shaping that are policy required. So here on the left of my slide, we have an existing PIFO block from Domino, where we see that we have sort of one queue used for shaping and one queue used for scheduling. I'm gonna compose these blocks together to build my hierarchical policy. So the problem now that we have is I have lots more different shaping classes to support. However, uh, we are not going to take this naive implementation here. Uh, the reason is, is that this does not scale well in terms of an efficient hardware implementation. Okay. This is not a problem though, uh, because of the following insight. This is the insight that we don't need more than a single queue to do shaping. This is because all shaping can be done in terms of wall clock time as a rank on my priority queue. And so that is what we've done here in the design of the Loom uh, implementation of our new policy DAG. So in this case, we have the following priority. We have memcached competing versus Spark, but we have two flows from memcached, the yellow and the green. The yellow flow will be rate limited. The green flow will not be rate limited. The blue flow is Spark and is bandwidth heavy. So what we do is we initially do all of our queuing and scheduling as if there were no shaping. 
So what's going to happen here is new packets from memtashd are going to show up, flow one and flow two. We're just going to enqueue them in our priority queues as before. OK, and so now we're, gonna, our, we're ready to send a packet. We'll dequeue our packet. We'll first get a packet from the green flow. At this point, we will check if there's any rate limit that needs to be honored. In this case, we find that there's not. We send the packet out the wire. Now we'll dequeue the head of our packet again. We get the yellow flow. And see, the important thing here is that now we check to see if there's a rate limit that is being violated. Because we find that there is, in fact, a rate limiting being violated, we'll add it to our shaping queue. We'll go back. We'll then re-enqueue it into our scheduling queues once its time has passed, and we'll go ahead and schedule it. So the key point here is that we're able to efficiently implement our new policy abstraction in hardware because of this key design that allows us to reuse a shaping queue. Okay, so moving on, uh, the final contribution I'm going to talk about is in terms of updating our NIC packet scheduler. Flows, start and stop, applications, tenants, all of these things are dynamic in the lifespan of my server. Uh, it is important to ensure that we can rapidly and quickly update our NIC packet scheduler as needed. Okay. And the major challenge for this is the PCIe link. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but PCIe has latencies that is significant, and it has throughput limitations that are quite small. OK. So in particular, our goal here with Loom is we want to be able to send traffic at line rate and update scheduling for new flows all with less than 100 mega or sorry, 1 mega op uh, of PCI writes per transaction. So the two challenges to this is that in the worst case, I need to generate two PCIe writes per packet, which would be over 16 mega ops of writes. And we also don't have sufficient data in our NIC for packet scheduling. This is because we have to schedule the DMA reads before we have access to any packet headers or packet data for things like classification. So to overcome this in Loom, we've introduced a new interface that uses batched updates and inline metadata. Uh, briefly, in batched updates, rather than generating a single PCI write per packet, we will process our packets in a batch. And then once we have a batch, we will notify the NIC about this in a FIFO doorbell queue through a single write. Okay. The other thing we do is that we now we have added scheduling metadata to our descriptors themselves. So this means that when our descriptors are read by the NIC, they can be read and stored in the PIFO in the correct order. And now our DMA scheduler will read these big data transfers from main memory in the correct order, which allows us to efficiently schedule our data. OK. I said earlier that we would have an implementation evaluation. Now um, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Briefly, um, unfortunately, Loom is not a hardware prototype yet. We are actively working on developing this, but right now there is a software prototype out there and open and developed. Okay, in this, we use the Berkeley Extensible Software Switch, similar to Eiffel, and we use a C++ PIFO implementation as a starting point for our new abstraction. And to evaluate this, we're going to do 10 and 40 gigabit Cloud Lab evaluations. Uh, and also, uh, this is the point where I'd like to say that Loom is open source. If you would like to see the code or talk about it or use it for anything, uh, please go to GitHub, start a conversation. OK, so there's three things that we're going to talk about here in our Loom evaluation. Really, three questions we want to answer. Can we drive line rate while enforcing policies? Can we isolate real applications? And did we actually manage to improve the efficiency of our OS NIC interface? So to answer the first question, we did some micro benchmarks in Linux with the iperf tool. OK, so in this case, we have three tenants, and our policy is that each tenant should receive an equal share. Uh, the problem here is that each tenant starts up four times more flows than the previous tenant. And so in this case, when our default, our network uh, by default is going to go to per flow fairness, this is not going to lead to our policy. OK, so we're going to look at three different runs here. The first is SQ. This is using a single queue. The second is MQ. This is using one queue per core, with each core trying to locally enforce the scheduling policy. Then we're going to look at Loom, which uses a queue per flow and offloads all scheduling to the NIC. 
So the first thing we see here in our SQ figure is that uh, SQ can enforce our isolation policy, but it is only able to achieve about 10 gigabit per second line rate. In contrast, MQ achieves our 40 gigabit per second line rate in this experiment, yet is not able to ensure that these tenants fairly share policy. Uh, in contrast, Loom here is able to drive near our 40 gigabit line rate and ensure that our flows are scheduled according to our policy. Okay, so briefly, we're gonna look now at competing applications. In this case, we're gonna put Spark and Spark together in our policy that they should fairly share bandwidth. Here on the left, we have Linux and the MQ configuration, and what we see is that when the two jobs are active at the same time, they do not fairly share the network. This is because they use different cores and they have different numbers of flows across each cores. In contrast, if we look at the Loom figure, when our two jobs are active at the same point in time, they fairly share the network bandwidth. In conclusion, we can ensure that competing fa jobs fairly share bandwidth even if they have different numbers of flows. Okay, briefly, in the interest of time, we're gonna go over this. Uh, if we have a latency-sensitive and a bandwidth-sensitive application uh, with default Linux QDisk, even uh, with packet scheduling, we can't ensure they're isolated. This is because of the problem at the beginning with our round-robin scheduler. Loom solves this problem as well. Okay, so we have a new interface that we'd like to evaluate. So to do this, we look at a worst case scenario where we're sending a new packet from a different flow uh, in 64 kilobyte batches at a time. So what we can see here is that Linux under this workload will be generating over 8 million PCIe updates per second. With Loom, we have a very modest 191K updates per second meeting our goal. Okay, this was a lot to take in. Hopefully you came along with me for the ride, uh, but now it's time to conclude. So, the big point that I would like to drive home is that while we would love to do packet scheduling to ensure that our applications are isolated, we currently can't do all of our packet scheduling in software and ensure that we can drive line rate and isolate our applications. Okay. The only solution that we see to this problem is that we need a new NIC where we offload all of our packet scheduling to the NIC. Uh, and this has the added benefit of reducing our CPU overheads at the same time. Okay, and then in conclusion, we just saw in these valuation, this new design can lead to reductions in latency, increases in throughput, and improvements in fairness for our co-located applications on the same server. Thank you, uh, if you now have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Hey, Brent, hey, uh, nice talk. Uh, Yas from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so when you mentioned fairness, uh, so when you have these multiple tenants sitting on the same machine, often what you actually need is like something like multi-resource fairness, right? Yeah. Uh, CPU, memory, and other things. Have you thought about how you might be able to implement those kinds of things in Loom? Yeah, thank you. That's a brilliant question. Um, and, oh, and, that, and that's because that's one that I not only have a backup slide for, but I have an entire separate paper for. Um, <laughs> So in this case, uh, I would say the NIC is most definitely a multi-resource uh, device. We have the DMA engine, we have its own on-chip network, we have, especially for now going to a smart NIC or RDMA NIC, we now have NIC execution engines which we need to schedule over. Uh, in short, my, my current answer to this is my uh, paper panic where we propose essentially local scheduling queues at each sort of execution engine and shared resource on our NIC. Uh, but we're still, I think, implementing and evaluating that for its effectiveness. Uh, Chris Kuzirakis, Google and Stanford. Uh, great talk. Uh, I, have, I want to clear up a little bit this whole uh, back and forth between hardware and software uh, we've had in the session. So if I was to stick a few processor cores on the NIC, Mm -hmm. Can I still do this stuff using uh, hardware? So what are you yeah. suggesting here? Uh, do things in actual hardware ASIC style or FPGA or something like that? Or can I actually use a smart NIC and get most of the stuff? There's also an interesting uh, debate you can have here about having things on a PCIe link yeah. or on shared memory. Yeah, I mean, so that's a great point uh, and one that I sort of skipped over but was hoping to get a question on. Um, so I think the, the short answer is 
is that it's not completely and totally hopeless. You can do some packet scheduling in software. The, the key insight here is that from my scheduling tree, I should have essentially the SQ model starting from whatever branch I'm taking off into software. But so essentially this prevents us from doing multi-thread parallelism across my software scaling, but it does allow me to do some sort of hybrid approach. Uh, I think in general, the reason we didn't talk about this is if it fits on hardware and it meets your timing requirements, you should just do it on hardware. If now you're in some scenario where you can't though, there, there is, um, uh, more that can be done. I think I, you had something else about smart NICs. I don't think I quite caught the rest of that, but hopefully that answered your question. Oh, David it, it, it's okay. David Anderson, Carnegie Mellon. Um, I'll give you a chance to answer the same question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think your core argument is that in this case, the NIC is the locus at which the resources being consumed are visible globally. Yeah. Is, that a, is that a fair? Yeah, I think that's a great way of expressing it. I wish I would have put that on my slides. Okay. <laughs> so. So I, I accept that premise, and I, I usually look for physics-based reasons to understand why to put something in hardware. Mm -hmm. um, what I don't understand is that in current systems, we have a bunch of other things that we also need to do when we're talking about multi-tenant isolation. Yeah. Um, we're going to be doing encryption. We're going to be you know, putting them in encapsulated things to ship them around yeah. the network. We're running open vSwitch. Mm -hmm. How do your arguments play out when I take it and put these things in the more complex environment that I really schedule in a multi-tenant data center? Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question, and I think, uh, again, I'm going to maybe defer to this uh, other work panic, where I think what we really want is the full packet generation consumption steps should be pushed into the NIC. So you're talking about things we have, you know, uh, maybe trivially our packet header parsing and deparsing and all of these things. Um, and so... Currently, we still have to do all of this in our software before we would shove it onto our LoomNIC for packet scheduling. And so I think the world that I'm envisioning is something more like the P4 program on your NIC where I am giving packet data buffers like RDMA and the NIC just automatically generates uh, everything uh, both on the transmit and receive side. And so I think the, I'm not sure that quite answered your question though. I feel like you maybe have a little bit of a follow up. No, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll take it offline. I'm, I'd like to dig into this more. Sounds great. <laughs>